Realm presents Silverwood, Episode 7. Mommy, can we have story time? Christina asked. Sure, darling, Tasha answered, carrying another steaming pot of tea from the stove. Tasha felt a jolt of pain. Wounds she didn't remember receiving ached beneath homemade bandages. There were flashes of memories, yet they seemed so distant that she couldn't put them together, as if they had happened a lifetime ago and they didn't seem to matter anymore, not now that she'd found contentment in the tiny cabin nestled in the forest. She had already set the table for a tea party, something Christina begged her to partake in, and since night had fallen, it seemed like a cozy activity. They'd already had two pots of sweet tea with honey, she was more comfortable since accepting her new life, and happiness was already blossoming in her heart. But she did feel a deep exhaustion, something that stemmed from her life before. She pushed the puzzle pieces of her past away, intent on keeping them buried until they stayed dead. Once upon a time, there was a little princess, Christina began. Oh, you're going to tell me a story? When you finish, I'll tell you one. Tasha poured their cups full. All the princess ever wanted was a family, a mommy to take care of her and love her. She tried a few mommies and daddies, but they were always mean and ran away from the princess. The little princess was forced to do something to them for being mean, for hurting her. I hope this story has a happy ending, Tasha said. It does, Christina said. But first, she had to go through a lot of pain because her first mommy and daddy, the ones who made her, they forgot about her too. They didn't care at all when her second mommy and daddy took her away and brought her here to live in the forest. They tied her up and put her in the car and, and the first mommy and daddy, they didn't come look for her because they were afraid of the princess, of the power she was born with. Where is that happy ending you promised me? Tasha asked. After years and years, one day, the little princess found a new mommy, one who made her feel special no matter how she was born, and they lived happily ever after. Oh, I love that story. Tasha smiled, eyes teary, but a few parts of the child's story stuck in her mind, raising a muted alarm. The little princess was forced to do something to them for being mean, for hurting her. The first mommy and daddy didn't even care the girl was taken away and forced to live in the forest. The princess was born with powers that caused them to be afraid of her. It's the best type of story because it came true, Christina answered. I love you, mommy. I love you too and Tasha felt ashamed for wondering about the message wrapped in Christina's story. Emilio peered into the old cabin through a dusty window, but it was dark outside, and with very little moonlight, he was left squinting into a poorly lit kitchen. The scent of his and Jeremy's co-workers' blood splashed across their clothing, hung in his nostrils, he continued to watch as Tasha and the young girl talked. He couldn't make out the words, but Tasha smiled and nodded in agreement. It was all so surreal. Emilio had heard through the office grapevine of Tasha's recent health troubles, but he had no clue why she would be here now, drinking tea in a cabin with an unknown child. The bear didn't move, Jeremy whispered. That's ridiculous. If there was a teddy bear, it didn't just walk off on its own. Ridiculous? So was the paintball game turning psychotic, but... Amelia wasn't so sure about knocking on the door anymore. The scene inside played on. A merry little tea party that somehow felt off. Tasha and the girl looked like a mother and beloved daughter giggling and sipping from their flowery teacups. Yet it felt more like a child playing with a doll. It was all make-believe. Something isn't right about this, Amelia whispered. Nothing's right about any of this, Jeremy answered, his voice sounding panicked and desperate. But we need help. It's dark out here, 
and the forest is filled with psychos. Shh. Emilio ducked out of view of the window. Don't shush me. He couldn't see Jeremy very well, but he could tell that his partner was terrified, and the argument they'd already had didn't help ease the tension. It felt like a nightmare on so many levels, one Emilio wished he could just wake up from. He hoped it would all be over soon so he and Jeremy could finish the discussion they were having about their relationship and future together. If there was one left... Tasha felt a comforting warmth. She tried to embrace her contentment, but the strange haze around her memories still troubled her. It seemed as if all those thoughts and troubles were disappearing somewhere, slipping away from her with each sip of tea and the passing minutes. This girl, Christina, was healing her worn-out heart in a way Tasha couldn't comprehend, but she was happy to have the weight of suffering lifted from her. Tasha didn't understand how, exactly, but being with the girl was helping her to forget all her troubles from her life before she climbed on a bus and headed for the Forest of Silverwood. Things she foggily remembered, but they didn't feel important anymore. Maybe if she just stayed with Christina, they would be a family, just like Tasha always wanted, and their life together would be all she ever needed. That's what was important now. A mother and her baby girl sharing life and happiness within a small forest cabin, she thought. Sounds like a fairy tale. Tasha only felt one nagging desire beginning to creep in. There were momentary flashes of a male face smiling lovingly at her, a husband or boyfriend, someone she knew before. She tried to remember his name, but couldn't. Her brain conjured the traditional images of family life, which always included a male presence, a husband or father, brother or son. It was a dynamic her fairy tale life was missing. Their cabin needed that. She wished there were more members of the family to love, specifically that male figure. Maybe one day I'll have a brother or a daddy again. Wouldn't you like that, Mommy? Tasha looked up. What was that? Mommy missed what you said. I kind of wish we had more family, Christina repeated. Like a big brother or daddy. Tasha felt a strange pang in her gut, a distant warning, but she wasn't sure why. A warmth clouded her mind again, and she let it go. She was with her family. She didn't have anything to worry about. Mommy, do you like your tea? Christina asked. Of course, dear. You are the sweetest girl for making tea with Mommy. There's nowhere in the world I would rather be. tortured shriek echoed from somewhere far off in the dark forest. Jeremy tossed a frightened glance over his shoulder and then grabbed Emilio's hand. What do we do? he whispered. Emilio shook his head and turned his attention back to the window. A huge smile of pearly white spread across Christina's face. This is all I ever wanted, she said. Me too. Tasha responded with a smile. I've never had anyone to sit and talk with. You're the best, Mommy. Having Christina say such a thing made Tasha's heart fill with sadness. The girl had been really neglected. She decided to have a real heart-to-heart -heart talk with the child. Tasha had been sipping tea and teaching the girl the facts of life, so to speak. It made her really feel like a mother to tell the little girl about the importance of telling the truth, reading books, not using profanity, and eating healthy food. She never stopped to notice that they had been seated there for hours. The sun had fallen while they shared their mother-daughter talk, and the moon rose in its place while Tasha told Christina about right and wrong and how to be a good person. Tasha thought she could recall a woman teaching her about life, possibly her own mother, but she couldn't quite remember clearly. The girl was beginning to understand some of the lessons, 
However, there were a few things that she disagreed with her new mommy over. One of the biggest things they didn't see eye to eye on was the punishment others deserved and what to do with those bad boys and girls who wanted to hurt them. It brought them to the little girl's past, the parents she had before, and why they ran from her and straight into a forest fire just to be free of her. Christina didn't elaborate much on them. When Tasha pressed, Christina grew teary-eyed and said, I had to hurt them, Mommy. They hurt me, too. I know you weren't treated nice, honey, but I can't allow you to hurt anyone anymore. We've talked about manners and being a good girl, and hurting people isn't what good girls do. You're past that now. It wasn't always me. Teddy would protect me, too. Tasha's expression changed when the creature was mentioned. Fear and confusion crept into her eyes. Christina's tears vanished and her expression hardened. Jeremy shifted. Are we knocking on the door or not? Another scream echoed from the forest. This one, while still muted, was much closer. I don't know, Emilio said. If we could just hear what was going on. Maybe if I put my ear against the glass. The mention of the bear sent a shock through Tasha, bringing back a flood of terrifying memories. The way it smelled and sounded. The face of her attacker lying in the bloody mud beside her. And the bear standing there, dangerously close and intent on ending her, too. It gave her a sick feeling in her stomach. Then, as suddenly as it had come, the memory faded. Her skin felt cold and sweaty, but then that familiar inner warmth returned. Christina sat forward and poured another cup of tea. Tasha felt a sudden pressure in her bladder. I think this is my last cup, dear. Come on, Mommy. Just for a little while longer? It's been so long since I've had a tea party. Well, all right, Tasha agreed, pretending to drink from the cup rather than actually swallowing any more. But after this, I'll need to pee. Christina giggled. A thump on the window pane made Tasha jump. Christina's smile faded. She squinted at the dark window. Someone's here. She was up and across the floor before Tasha could act. Christina, where are you going? No one ruins my family time. Don't go out there, Tasha urged. We can talk about this. You can't hurt people. Tasha glanced at the window and glimpsed a slightly familiar face pressed against the glass. She tried to remember the man's name, but couldn't. I'm sorry, Mommy, Christina said. But I have to make sure no one hurts you ever again. Emilio staggered away from the window as the little girl moved toward the door. Go, go, go! Emilio yelled, shoving Jeremy, whose attention was still focused on the forest behind them. What's wrong? Just run! The two men fled, running around the side of the cabin and scrambling across the unkempt yard. They made it twenty paces before sliding to a halt. Emilio squawked in surprise as the little girl appeared in front of them. It seemed impossible that she could have gotten there in what must have been the blink of an eye. Over the little girl's shoulder, he spotted Tasha, slowly following, wearing a look of confusion. Jeremy waved to Tasha, but then dropped his hand when she didn't respond. Tasha? Emilio spoke hesitantly, realizing she wasn't herself. Um, Emilio? Jer... Jer... Jeremy? Tasha pronounced their names slowly, as if she barely remembered them, even though they had worked around each other for years and had just shared a bus ride together for hours. The child glared hard at them, her brown eyes full of rage. From the forest, more distant cries rang out. Tasha, Emilio said, What are you... You just spoiled our tea! The little girl shrieked. You ruined family time! You are bad boys, and now you will be taught a lesson. She snapped her little fingers, and from out of the shadows, a lumbering nightmare trotted over. 
It was the teddy bear. But up close in the moonlight, Emilio could see its true mangled form. Rotting burlap and dirty stuffing poked out of its hide in places, mixed with leaves, tree bark, and what appeared to be real fur and skin. Its one good eye glared balefully, while the other was only a button hanging on a loose piece of thread. It moved quickly, with a speed that belied its hulking form. Then it roared. <laughs> and the rest of the forest fell silent. Its roars rumbled through their rib cages, making their hearts stutter. What the fuck? Jeremy screamed, pulling Emilio close. Potty mouth, the little girl berated. You should have to rinse it out with soap, but instead, I will just have my teddy bear deal with you for ruining my family time. Standing on its hind legs, the bear extended its massive claws toward them, as if showing off. It growled, bearing sharp black and yellow teeth, and then plodded toward them. Emilio tried to flee, but Jeremy held him tight, babbling with fear. They clutched each other. Emilio closed his eyes, desperately hoping the end would be quick. Stop now, Tasha cried. Christina, what did Mommy say? I said no killing, please. Honey, it's not okay. The child snapped her fingers again, and the bear stopped its advance. Emilio could see by her expression that the girl was contemplating her next move. She looked at the two men with contempt. The bear creature frothed at the mouth, its saliva dripping in a long string, hanging from its misshapen jowls. It was close enough that they could smell its rancid breath, the unforgettable odors of blood and decay. Emilio shuddered as his bladder let go and a warmth spread in his pants. It's okay, Jeremy whispered, repeating the phrase like a mantra. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Please, Tasha said, coming closer to kneel in front of the little girl. We talked about this. Christina's eyes stayed focused on Tasha. The bear loomed over the two men. I think I have an idea. Tasha said to the child. You want to make Mommy happy, right? M mommy Emilio stammered. Christina turned her eyes back to the two men. Please, Jeremy cried. It's okay. <laughs> the bear roared, silencing him. Its body remained tense, awaiting Christina's command. Dan had been left in charge of the remaining Cub Scouts while Fred and the other chaperones went in search of Seth, Gwen, and Taylor. He had no idea that the wind would shift and he'd find their campout becoming more like a horror movie than a vacation. Dan was bent over the flames, feeding it small handfuls of kindling. The minutes passing felt more like hours and he began to second-guess his eagerness to be left in charge of the handful of boys. The scouts had already asked about 15 times if they could make s'mores. Dan listened to them chatter about it, their voices sounding as if they were being played on fast forward, like cracked-out chipmunks. How a certain scout had never had a s'more, and how he shouldn't have much sugar but just couldn't be a scout without eating a s'more. Okay, Dan snapped. The children looked at him like he'd just pissed on the campfire. He took a deep breath, realizing he'd overreacted. Go grab some firewood, and if I can find the supplies, we'll have s'mores. His allergies were getting out of hand, and his eyes itched. He worried that his seasonal asthma might start acting up. He searched his pocket for his inhaler. It was there beside his chapstick. He sat down and gripped the sides of his head. Dan only wanted the boys to shut up. Their prepubescent voices grated on his nerves until he finally had to tune them out and let them do whatever they wanted to keep them occupied. They walked a little ways away and were busy collecting firewood. At least he thought so. Feed the fire. Dan hesitated at the sound of the voice, but didn't hear it clearly. It was gone in an instant and he thought it was his imagination playing tricks on him in the dark forest. 
He then thought that it seemed a little suspicious that the children had grown quiet. All he heard were faint whispers, but they sounded excited. So he didn't bother asking what they were up to. He figured as long as they left him the hell alone, he didn't care. Besides, they were close enough for him to hear if they got hurt or in any kind of trouble. The children weren't in his hair anymore, but he still couldn't get his temper to abate. He daydreamed about smashing Hogan in the face with a burning log, and it seemed to make him feel a bit better. But then his imagination built into a bizarrely brutal fantasy about smashing the scouts' skulls with rocks from the campfire ring. He paused for a moment, hovering over the fire, wondering why he was thinking about such awful things. An explosion of pain sent him reeling forward. He caught himself on the hot rock circling the fire, his palms instantly blistering. He screamed and thrust himself back away from the heat. He smelled singed hair and felt warmth running down his back. He was on his knees before the campfire, gasping to breathe, but his lungs felt as if they'd closed completely. His asthma was flaring up, which sent him into a panic as he looked around to find the source of the pain in the back of his skull. He gripped his chest as he fished the inhaler out of his pocket and took a deep puff. Feed the fire. Dan heard the voice as small shadows surrounded him. His eyes fell on the sticks in their hands. They moved in blinding unison, jabbing the sharp tips of the sticks into his flesh. A small hand yanked his inhaler from his desperate grip and tossed it into the fire. The flames leapt into the air hungrily in a quick explosion. He tried to scream, what the fuck? But his breath fled from him, leaving him wheezing and weakening. I heard that if you heat the end, it helps it slide in better, a bony red-headed scout named Trenton said. They jabbed the ends of the sticks into the hot embers. Dan tried to stand, but felt another blow to his head. His body fell not a foot from the flames. Dan's head spun, and his rage howled within his brain to kill them all. But the lack of oxygen left him incapacitated. He got on his hands and knees in a final attempt to crawl away from the nightmare, only to feel the burning hot sticks being thrust into him, forcing him onto the fire. He no longer had the breath to force out any screams. The flames fed on him ravenously as he died. A human s'more. I like mine extra toasty. Scotty was a pudgy scout, and he rubbed his stomach and licked his lips. Me first, shouted Dylan, the scout who had never eaten a s'more. The look in their eyes as they exchanged feral glances was like a gang of hungry wild dogs ready to fight one another for the kill before them. Blood and pollen dusted their faces and hands, driving them into a frenzied brawl to be the first to taste Dan's charred meat. All across the forest of Silverwood and through the deepening haze of ashy pollen, a massacre was taking place in the dark. Having finally encountered each other, the remaining Cub Scouts and Hirsch Capital employees clashed in a running frenzy of death and mayhem. Adults smashed children into useless sacks of broken bones and then drowned them in puddles. Kids teamed up on adults, mutilating them beyond recognition and laughing with joy as their blood soaked into the forest floor. A voice beyond and within the trees sang in a choir of violent delight urging the humans to continue the slaughter. A band of Cub Scouts impaled Sam from the mailroom on broken tree branches and watched him writhe like a worm on a fish hook until he bled out. The clouds of pollen sprinkled over them drove men, women, and children insane for blood. Scouts strangled other scouts, and the paintball group did the same, turning on each other with no mercy for the people they knew in ordinary life. No one was safe as the night ran red with the blood of both groups. Two men, Stefan and Daryl, who had once been the best of friends at HCAP, as they called it, beat one another senseless with the butts of their paintball guns until Daryl fell lifeless, his mouth hanging open like a suffocating fish. But before Stefan could rejoice in his victory, a heavy rock was thrown against the back of his head. 
He spun around in confusion as his brain began to swell within his damaged skull. A boy stood there laughing, pointing at him as his vision went black. The child was no taller than Stefan's own son, a son whose face and name he could no longer recall. The earth moved out from under his feet as his disoriented body fell to the forest floor. Stefan could hardly move due to the excruciating pain in his head. He clawed at the dirt and kicked his legs, but went nowhere. He thought he could still hear the child's laughter, taunting him. A thud in the dirt beside his hand made him stop his useless retreat. A second thud connected with his ribcage. He realized the boy was happily pelting him with fist-sized stones. His only escape came with death. The sap creatures rampaged through the woods, morphing and moving among the combatants, taking lives from both groups, swallowing children and devouring adults, wrapping gooey tendrils around them, and slowly digesting them while they screamed. If not for the darkness and the haze of pollen all around them, maybe the people would have recognized what was happening and run for their lives. Instead, consumed by madness, they killed and slaughtered, feeding the sap's appetite only to be gobbled up in turn by its physical manifestations in an endless chain of death. Timmy McNamara from the Scout Pack wildly beat Hirsch Capital's Deborah with a camp shovel. It made a metallic clang as it connected with her left hip. His face was an odd mask of innocence and madness as he pounded her mercilessly, gleefully breaking her ribs with quick blows. Hands flailing, Deborah tumbled over a broken log. Timmy laughed believing he had the upper hand, only to be surprised when her fumbling grasp found a paintball gun lying near a stump. Timmy was even more surprised when the first shot she took hit him directly in his left eye, blinding him in an explosion of bright orange paint and blood as his eye popped with the velocity of the speeding projectile. He hesitated, shaking his head. He brought his hand up and touched the blood mixed with orange paint streaming down his cheek glaring at her with a murderous hatred using the good eye he had left. She was grinning, a smile that transformed her face into something resembling a goblin shark. Never shoot anyone not wearing their protective masks and eyewear, and never shoot anyone within 15 feet or closer, Deborah shouted, recalling Devon's important safety rules before lifting the gun again and hastily taking aim at the boy before he could attack. The wounded old lady proved to be a crack shot when her next paintball blasted through his front teeth. The impact rocked his head back and filled his mouth with bitter-tasting paint and blood. Timmy took a step back as Deborah's finger curled around the trigger once more. He tried to flee, but being blinded and caked in blood and paint, he ran directly into the path of a charging sap creature. This one shaped like a massive elk. The dripping animal impaled the young scout on its distorted antlers of black goo and carried him off into the woods. There, the antlers protruding through his chest morphed into a pair of strong hands that tore him into two pieces. Pollen swirled and covered the scene, mixing with the blood-soaked ground, creating gory mud that clung to the combatants. The insanity in the screams of the dying and of those doing the killing weren't all that different except some faded, while others continued to echo triumphantly through the trees. Hirsch Capital had been Gregory Marshall's very life. He loved his job in accounting so much that he never got married or had any children, because he devoted all his free time to the company. At least, that's the excuse he told himself. In actuality, it probably had more to do with his selfish attitude and atrocious halitosis. Nothing mattered like his job, but as he aged, he would often wonder if maybe he should have had more than just his work life. Maybe he should have had those other experiences everyone was always going on about. Now, at the age of 57, he figured it was probably too late to really worry about such things and he should just enjoy what he had. He thought the stay in the bungalows was a reward for being an exemplary employee, a pat on the back. But now, as he held his stomach wound and tried to keep his intestines from slipping between his fingers, he didn't care. He thought only of killing everyone in sight, of contributing to the slaughter, of finding a few more people to bludgeon before he fell over dead. 
His last thoughts were not of pride in his work or regrets over never fathering a son. It was how he only wished he could have made it to wherever Devin was hiding to rip his stupid face off. The sap continued to influence and murder however it could, driving the adults and children into a bloodlust that kept them crawling on their own bellies, dragging their shattered legs in hopes of tearing through someone's Achilles tendon with their teeth. Like rabid hyenas on PCP, they wouldn't stop killing, and the forest reveled in it. Yes, it commanded, with the voice of the night. More blood. More violence. The forest soil soaked up the offerings. The sap soaked up the psychic energy of mass trauma, gorging itself. Both were needed for it to reopen the door and escape this hell of meat and matter. The cracks between dimensions were already forming. Time was once again in disarray, flooding Silverwood with the flotsam and jetsam of the past, present, and future. The walls between worlds shivered and thinned. Soon, it would reach peak strength and break the barriers wide open. Then, all that remained would be the key. Once that had been obtained, the loathsome, lonely presence could go back home to dwell in the cold, empty darkness beyond, a place where human eyes weren't meant to see, where time and space and form had no meaning, a place where matter didn't matter. Soon, it promised. Soon. Mommy says it's not okay to kill you, but how can I let you come here and ruin our tea party? You were spying on us like bad boys. Why? Instead of answering her, Emilio sighed with relief as the bear retreated a few paces to stand behind the girl. Why? She demanded again. Why were you spying on us? We were looking for help, Jeremy said at last. Somewhere we would be safe. Something bad is happening in the forest. Something bad is happening here, too, Emilio thought. What is it? The girl looked past them, scanning the trees. Is it another fire? Or have they come back? Emilio wondered who they were. Before he could ask, Tasha stepped forward and spoke. Christina, bring them inside and offer them tea like a good girl. The silence was tense. Christina seemed to be struggling with what she wanted to do. Bring them in, honey. These men are nice, and I'm sure they'd love to spend time with us. Christina frowned. But these men could be family, too. Give it a chance. The girl's frown turned into a smile. The bear seemed to relax. Come inside, she offered, and let's have tea. Emilio thought the sudden and extreme change in her demeanor was almost as terrifying as the monstrous bear. One moment she was in a murderous rage, and the next she was smiling and ready for a tea party. Christina was obviously more than she appeared. A much older soul trapped in the guise of a child, or a girl far too clever and deranged for her age. She was playing the role of a spoiled brat to reach her own needs, but to what end? The bear towered behind her, its good eye focused on them with a hungry gaze. The girl's words were sweet, but Emilio was sure they dripped with venom. No, this is not okay, he thought. We're in more danger here than we were in the forest. He wanted to run, but when he looked at Jeremy... His partner's demeanor was unnerving as well. A strange smile played at the corner of his lips, and he entered the cabin as if nothing terrifying had just taken place. Begrudgingly, Emilio followed Jeremy inside to the strange tea party, hoping his boyfriend had a plan to get away and that the smile on his face was a smokescreen to lull the evil child into believing the two men meant her no harm. Jeremy and Emilio sat before frilly placemats with their own ornate cups of steaming tea. Christina smiled even wider as Jeremy inhaled the floral scent of the tea and nodded. 
Smells lovely, he said. Emilio's stomach churned. They were in danger, and his partner was acting as if everything was normal. His eyes went to the broken mirror, and in a small shard, he saw the reflection of a charred corpse sipping tea and carrying on a conversation. Terror filled him, yet he knew he couldn't let Christina know he saw her true form or he'd end up being torn to pieces by Teddy. He tried to be discreet for fear of getting Jeremy and himself slaughtered. He kicked his boyfriend's foot under the table, only to be ignored. Jeremy took a sip of tea and sighed. Emilio could hear true relief in it. I feel safer already, Jeremy said. This is much better than being out in those woods. I'm happy you feel like that, the girl smiled. Out there was so dark and frightening. I felt all alone. Emilio blinked, wounded by the words. Anger and disbelief built inside him. You weren't alone, he protested. I was with you. I know, but you didn't make me feel this safe, not after our discussion. That is personal, Jeremy. I know, I know. Everything is a secret with you. Jeremy seemed to be sinking into the strange atmosphere, oblivious to the wrongness of the whole situation, and accepting the promise of protection from the little girl who only minutes before would have killed them both if it weren't for Tasha. Emilio noticed that Tasha also seemed to completely ignore the insanity that was taking place in the cabin. No one there had any sense left but him, and he clung desperately to his reason for Jeremy's sake as well as his own. The sweet-looking yet terrifying child named Christina sat across from him, smiling. Yet there was darkness in her eyes. Was he the only one who could see that the girl was no ordinary child? That her presence was sinister? That she was waiting to make her move? And who was she? Was it all linked? The cabin and its inhabitants? The slaughter and the paintball field? The feeling of murderous anger that had seemingly taken over everyone he knew? Or was she something else? A malevolence from before tonight? Whatever her origin, Amelia was sure of one thing. The cabin was no different than a mousetrap and Christina and her bear could snap at any moment. Christina was plotting. He could feel it. Something was coming. The other three drank their tea and held polite conversation while Emilio furtively but frantically searched for an escape. He looked to every window, but they all seemed too far away to reach before being caught. And even if he did manage to get outside, the bear would surely be waiting for him. You're safe here. Tasha's words made Emilio wince. Was he being that obvious? I don't feel safe, he admitted. I won't let anything happen to you. Christina added more tea to Jeremy's cup. Emilio felt an uncomfortable sensation, like smothering bugs crawling over him. An image formed in his head of himself and Jeremy sitting on the front porch holding hands, laughing and Christina picking wildflowers and presenting them to Tasha. He looked at Christina, and she smiled knowingly. For a moment, he thought of her charred reflection. It made his hands tremble and the vision disappear. The way her eyes focused on his, like they were burning holes through his skull, gave him a dizzy headache. She's trying to get into my mind. Stay out. Leave me alone. Leave Jeremy alone, too. You won't get to me by showing me childish fantasies. Her smile turned to a tight-lipped grin. Thank you, Jeremy said. We weren't safe out there. It was a nightmare. It was horrible, the things we saw. I just want to forget it all. What happened to you? Christina asked. We were here with a group from work, and I... I can't explain it. They all went crazy. Everyone started killing each other. The same group you came from, Tasha, Emilio pointed out. It was too difficult to hold back his defiance. 
If the other two just denied the girl, then they all might stand a chance. The feeling of hot insects crawling over him returned and doubled in force, but he fought it. Yes, I think I remember. We work together, Tasha asked slowly. Why are you here? Emilio asked. What's wrong with you? How can you not remember? Jeremy coughed and kicked Emilio under the table. Emilio looked at him and mouthed, What? Manners, Jeremy scolded. She was in trouble, Christina said. Just like the two of you, but I rescued her. She's my mommy now. Emilio's mouth hung open. But when he looked at Jeremy, his boyfriend kept his eyes on his teacup, offering no support. Thank goodness she saved you, Jeremy finally said. What a good daughter. What are you talking about? Emilio asked. The invading feeling stopped, dropped like a curtain. He would continue to challenge the thing known as Christina. He refused to let her take him over, to let her brainwash his boyfriend. Though he didn't shout it out loud like Jeremy really wished he would, Emilio was in love with him and would do anything to protect him. They needed to escape and get far away from the cabin and the twisted family inside it. You know what I'm talking about. The world out there is ugly, especially to people like us. I already told you we can't just run away, Emilio huffed. Why not? Tasha asked. We could be accepting of you, Christina offered. You two could be my brothers. I always wanted a big brother. This is all ridiculous, Emilio fumed. I mean, listen to yourselves. It's insane. Not really. Jeremy slid his hand across the table to grip Emilio's. We could be insane together. Do you want to join our family? Christina asked. Emilio couldn't take it anymore and stood. His teacup rattled. Grasping Jeremy by the hand, he attempted to pull his partner to his feet. No thank you. We really must be on our way now. Tasha promised you wouldn't hurt us, so... Come on, Jeremy. Jeremy jerked his arm away and looked shocked by Emilio's response. Are you crazy, Emilio? I'm not going back to that paintball field or that forest full of crazy people. No way in hell. Jeremy? I'm not going anywhere with a man who refuses to acknowledge my love, who keeps me hidden from sight. How will you protect my body when you never protect my heart? We don't have time for this, Amelia said. Don't you see what's going on? We're not arguing about this here. We're not arguing about it anywhere anymore. Jeremy turned back to his teacup. It was like a slap in the face. He was aware of Christina's and Tasha's eyes on him. When he glanced at the window, he saw the bear's lone eye on him as well. He watched the girl's smile morph into a snarl again, the face of a hungry wolf, a predator waiting to pounce. And then Jeremy turned to look at him again, and he bore that same expression. You know it's my dream to be a family. We can have it all, right here. We can be ourselves and be in love. Be ourselves? Emilio asked. Yes. Emilio thrust a finger at Tasha. She's not even herself. Look at her, Jeremy. Is she acting like a normal person? Tasha seems fine to me, Jeremy said. I am, she agreed. You're upsetting my mommy, Christina said, her tone inflectionless. I can feel it building out there in the forest. Something's opening the door again. Something that's not me or the ones who were here before. Not those who lived in the light. Not the scientist people. Something not from here. Don't you understand? Only I can keep you safe. Emilio shook his head and spoke up, his body trembling. No! Jeremy! Tasha, you must have hit your heads. We're leaving right now. He grabbed at his partner's hand again, but Jeremy refused. This time he pushed Emilio back. I'm staying. Go if you want to. You're too afraid to be happy. That, that's not true. It is true, Emilio. 
You want to hide who we really are forever. If that's what you want in life, then get out of here. Emilio froze, torn between his love for Jeremy, the force that kept him from becoming a puppet of Christina's, and the terror building in him. Christina frowned. If you don't join us, then you're bad, and you will be punished. You can't just come here and break up the tea party and hurt my family. The bear growled from outside the cabin. Christina looked Emilio in the eye and walked around the table, taking Jeremy and then Tasha by the hand. Go then, she taunted. And don't forget to say goodbye to Teddy on your way out. Go, Emilio, Jeremy urged. You're not the man I fell in love with. I can't believe I wasted my time thinking I'd ever be more than your dirty secret. Emilio looked into Jeremy's eyes but didn't see him anymore. This bizarre hold the child held on Tasha and Jeremy was inexplicable but real. Jeremy had fallen under her control. Emilio didn't want to be another one of her zombies. He'd caught a glimpse of what she truly looked like. It frightened him more than the forest filled with killers. Jeremy, his throat constricted, choking off the rest of his words. Emilio turned and bolted for the door, knowing the beast was waiting for him but praying he could outrun it. Shoving the cabin door open, he made a break for the trees. A horrific roar boomed like a thunderclap. He heard the pounding of feet behind him and smelled the great rancid puffs of breath as the bear gave chase. Emilio screamed. He thought he heard Jeremy laughing. Then another roar drowned out all sound. And he continued to run, leaving Jeremy behind him. Taylor stuck to the stream, and the farther he progressed, the more certain he was that, like many other things he learned about in nature, the weird pollen was affected by something, namely, fresh running water. It was a logical conclusion. His fixation on insects helped him remember the species that retreated to moving water to avoid being eaten by predators. He reasoned that if the creek kept the pollen at bay, it might work on the strange goo monsters as well. The two had to be related somehow. He splashed along, the water knee-deep at times, and kept moving with his eyes down. He didn't want to see how scary the forest was getting and how dangerous the night was becoming. The sounds were bad enough. In the distance, he could still hear the screaming, ugly cries like those of beasts, and it terrified him. His body was tired from roaming the forest for hours. The hike into the trees to look at what Harold discovered seemed like it had happened so long ago. His stomach growled, and his cold, wet feet hurt. But Taylor pushed himself to keep moving, he hoped the stream would lead him to some sort of civilization, a place where he could find help. He didn't like the idea of having to speak to strangers, but he knew his friends and the people he trusted were out there somewhere and in danger. Well, Harold wasn't anymore. The first sob caught him by surprise. Tears filled his eyes, and the world went blurry. Taylor stopped walking and wept, trembling as great racking sobs rattled his slender frame. When he was finished, he took off his thick glasses, wiped the steam from the lenses with his shirt, and then focused again. He sniffled, and his expression hardened. Gwen. She was all that mattered now. Gwen and her father. He had to find them, had to know if they were okay. He had to be brave, like Harold had been. He started off again, still following the creek. The splashing of the water helped him focus. He methodically plotted each step. To keep his mind off the scary things, he began mentally reciting a list of his favorite insects. Grasshopper, dragonfly, ant, cricket, honeybee, mantis. Occasionally he stopped to blow his nose on his shirt tail and wash his face with the water from the stream. It made him feel awake again. I'll help her, Harold. I promise. His voice sounded very small in the dark, 
and Taylor decided not to speak out loud anymore. After reciting his insect mantra for what felt like a thousand times, he saw a building of some kind in the distance, perched alongside the bank of the stream. He squinted in the darkness, letting his eyes adjust. Sure enough, it was a building made out of gray concrete blocks. The forest had nearly grown over the structure, making it look like some ancient ruin in a jungle. Taylor wondered if it was a place he could hide and rest. He limped out of the water and approached the structure. The closer he got to the building, the more nervous he became. What if it was unsafe? What if he found a bad person or some more of the goo monsters? He stopped, unable to move another foot as he battled his fear. He glanced back over his shoulder, wondering if he shouldn't try to hide in the brush until daylight. The urge was strong. But he just couldn't leave Gwen and Mr. Bailey out there in danger. Then he heard a metallic creaking sound. A sliver of light appeared in front of the building. Taylor? He thought he heard his name, but could he have been mistaken? Who would call out to him? He stammered and stumbled back a step fearing it was one of the black goo monsters calling him to his death. He wiped his hand on his nose and stood stone still, listening closely. Taylor, it's Gwen. He nodded. It was really her. The sound of her voice, his best friend, was such a relief. Taylor, come on. It's not safe. Gwen. He ran toward the building. Gwen stood in the doorway. The door had some kind of weird symbol on it a crown of some kind. She motioned him inside. Sighing with relief, he followed. Once inside, Gwen let the door clang shut. I knew you were coming, Gwen whispered. Tears welled up again. He couldn't explain why, but he didn't want Gwen to see him cry. So he did something unexpected by them both. He hugged her. It's okay, she said, patting his back. Harold... Taylor began, but before he could finish, someone interrupted. With a relieved expression, Mr. Bailey came forward and placed his hands on Taylor's shoulders. And for the few seconds Taylor was comfortable, they made eye contact and smiled. Taylor wasn't usually okay with people being in his personal space, but he could tell, even in this moment of craziness, that Mr. Bailey would protect him as if he were his own son. Are you okay, buddy? Mr. Belly removed his hands and stepped back. Nodding, Taylor disengaged from his embrace with Gwen and looked at the floor. I am now. Then he noticed a woman standing behind Mr. Bailey. Taylor thought she looked cool in a strange way, but he averted his eyes as he usually did in the presence of someone he didn't know or trust. I don't know how she was so sure, Mr. Bailey said. But Gwen told us... She knew you were coming. Smiling, the woman edged forward. We're so happy you're here. This is Lydia, Gwen said. She's okay. She's our new friend. He nodded and stared at a spot over Lydia's shoulder before looking down at his wet shoes again. Taylor was not completely comfortable with her, but if Gwen and Mr. Bailey said she was all right, then he would trust their judgment. I think I found something cool for you earlier, Taylor. Gwen stepped over to a desk with a computer on it and held up a plastic water bottle. He peered at it and saw the mummified remains of a giant moth inside. Awesome. Thanks, Gwen. Mr. Bailey spoke softly. Are you okay, Taylor? What are you doing out here alone? It's really scary outside, Mr. Bailey. I'm glad I found you. People are hurting each other. What do you mean? Who? Our people? Taylor shrugged. Our people? Other people? Both. Gwen was right about the creeper. I've seen it. Taylor. The creeper is just Gwen's term for her OCD. It's not a physical thing. Well, there's something out there, Taylor argued. It's a black, slimy goo. It turns people into monsters. The pollen turns them into monsters, too, but a different kind. Mr. Bailey glanced at Lydia. Both adults frowned. Gwen stared at Taylor, her eyes big and round. 
I saw some stuff out there, Taylor insisted. I'm telling the truth. I know you are, buddy, Mr. Bailey answered. Lydia saw some things too. Nodding, she bent down and looked Taylor in the eye. He quickly turned away. What did you see, Taylor? People killing each other? I saw that too, but I think they were just ghosts. Reflections from the past. Like watching a movie. They weren't ghosts. He still didn't meet her eye. Some of them were people I knew. We gotta do something. Right now, Mr. Bailey said. I think our best bet is to stay inside. Before Lydia arrived, I was reading through a lot of these old papers and computer drives. I think between the four of us, we might be able to figure out what's really going on and what to do about it. Emilio thrashed through brushes and brambles, cutting and scratching himself on dozens of sharp branches and thorns. He leapt over logs and crawled over man-sized rocks. He heard the bear lumbering along determinedly behind him. It sounded like he put some distance between them, but he dared not risk a glance over his shoulder for fear it would catch up. He ran in a zigzag pattern, more out of fear than calculation. Tears rolled from his eyes as he thought of Jeremy. Was it possible Jeremy's madness had been a ploy? Some way to distract Christina and Tasha while Emilio escaped? No, no, no. He wasn't pretending. Jeremy seemed sincere about joining the family, as they called it. What the fuck is going on in this forest? Silverwood is a fucking nightmare. Emilio had little time to really consider any of it. Gasping for breath, he wasn't confident that his exhausted, beaten body could continue. He heard bushes being plowed through and cracking branches ripped from trees as the bear continued to pursue him. The memory of its hideous face in the darkness made him lose focus and stumble. He hit the ground and rolled, feeling a snap in his shoulder and a burst of burning pain. His hopes of being able to outrun the thing began to fade. His mind fixated on the beast. Whatever the hell it was, the damn thing moved with unnatural speed and now sounded like it was gaining on him. Emilio's lungs burned and his body was covered in sweat, dirt, and blood. A short, heart-crushing sob escaped him. The dirt around the next bend was loose gravel, and his wobbly legs didn't hold as his feet slipped. Down he went, screaming in defeat. He lay there, looking up at the dark treetops, the pollen blotting out the stars. He closed his eyes and whispered Jeremy's name. He felt the bear emerge from the undergrowth, heard it, smelled it. Then he opened his eyes. Emilio wailed as claws pierced his body and ripped into his flesh. The creature lifted him from the ground and spun him like a rag doll. Grunting, it licked its misshapen lips with a black tongue. Stealing himself, Emilio yelled defiantly into its mangled face. Come on, you fuck! The beast bit down onto his head. Emilio tried to whisper Jeremy's name, but then the teeth pierced his skull. No, Tasha yelled at Christina. No, I said no killing. Please, honey, you're a good girl. If he doesn't want to be family, then let him go. It's okay. Look, you have a family that wants you. Don't ruin it by harming people. Christina turned and stared at them both. Jeremy, the newest member of the family, nodded. Tears streamed down his face. Mommy's right, he pleaded. Emilio doesn't deserve to die. Please just let him go. Killing is not the answer, sweetie, Tasha said. Every life is important. Christina glanced out into the forest. I'm sorry, Mommy. We can fix this. Come on. Jeremy started off after Emilio and the bear. Tasha glanced at Christina and then hurried after him. Christina sighed and then stalked begrudgingly behind them. They hurried through the trees, easily making their way on the path made by the charging bear. Deeper into the forest, a scream echoed. The three rounded a corner and saw the bear standing upon Emilio's bloodied body, crushing his corpse beneath its weight. 
Emilio had been torn to shreds. The top of his head was severed at the forehead, but his eyes were still wide open. No, Jeremy cried. He started to lunge forward, but the bear growled, snapping at him. Down, Teddy, Christina instructed. Go away. The beast looked almost wounded at the order, obviously hesitant to leave. Go back home. The bear turned and lumbered back toward the cabin, mewling grumpily, yet lingered within sight of the girl and stayed ready to attack at any moment. Christina, Tasha admonished. We can't be a family if you keep doing bad things. How can Jeremy and I enjoy family time with you if you're going to turn around and murder our friends? Christina hung her head and put her hands over her face, ashamed that her mother was so unhappy with her. You have to understand that killing is not what good girls do, and you can never do this again. Please hear me, honey. We care, and we really want this family to work, but we can't if you keep killing people. Christina slid her hands away from her face and looked Tasha in the eye. She nodded as a tear rolled down her face. Christina had held certain emotions at bay for so long, but now she let herself feel more than she had in a long time. She was seeing the importance of what Tasha was saying and even felt sorry for making Jeremy cry. I'm sorry, Mommy, she wept. It's all right, but it can't happen anymore. Tasha answered quietly. I think I know how to fix this, Mommy. I think I can make things right. Would that make you both happy? Jeremy looked up from Emilio. How are you going to do that? Easy, Christina explained. I was here before the thing that is out there now. So were lots of other people. I can bring them back. Tasha frowned in confusion. Bring... Who back, Christina? The little girl smiled. Everybody. Don't you see? Nobody has to be dead anymore. I don't understand. Tasha's frown deepened. Closing her eyes, Christina held her hands outstretched above her head. She trembled slightly and then shook. Thunder boomed across the sky. A forceful breeze sprang up tossing leaves and debris. Tiny whirlwinds swirled between the trees, scooping up pollen and dirt and small stones. Whatever is out there wants to get stronger. I can feel that. But I'm already strong. Even stronger than I was before I was brought here. The wind increased, and Tasha and Jeremy wobbled unsteadily on their feet. They blinked in confusion as another blast of thunder echoed across the night sky. It wasn't answered with lightning. Nothing shattered the darkness except the slight glow coming from Christina's tense form. I'll make everything better again, Mommy. Then the thunder died down and the wind subsided and the forest was still once again. Even the far-off cries of the others seemed to have ceased. What did... What did you do, honey? Tasha glanced around. What just happened? Christina smiled, watching as Emilio's mangled corpse struggled to rise behind Tasha and Jeremy. Out in the forest, the screams started up again. This time, they were met with new, more guttural moans and cries. You said no more killing, Christina explained. I made it so that no one has to die anymore. You're listening to Silverwood by Michelle Garza and Melissa Laysan, starring Neil Helligers and Sarah Malo Christensen. Produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Realm, listen away. Silverwood is written by Brian Keane, Richard Chismar, Stephen Kozanewski, Michelle Garza, and Melissa Laysan. Based on Silverwood by Tony E. Valenzuela. It is produced by Lydia Shama and executive produced by Molly Barton. Audio production, sound design, and editing by Amanda Rose Smith. Theme music by Brandon Roberts. <laughs>